All right, we want to again welcome you to His Grace Church where we're touching lives and changing hearts. God is doing great and wonderful things, isn't He? Let me. I, uh, my kid bought me this little thing. It's like a little upside down elephant. No, it's a pig, right? Goes on the table like that. Holds up your phone. The little piggy holding, little piggy holding up your phone. So, uh, all right. Again, welcome. And uh, let's pray. And I don't need two of these. And we'll get right into the word. And uh, we'll get moving here this morning. Amen. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. For we know that the entrance of your word gives and brings life and light. Father, we give you glory and honor and praise for all things that you've bestowed on us today. And we thank you for those things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. This is how, I'm sorry, this sometimes anal. <laughs> like you're not that way. I got, you know, want everything in its place. How many of you go home and you want everything in its place because it's easier to find? That's what my wife tells me. You know, everything has a place. I said, I know, it's right on the floor. Right. <laughs> That's what that, guys, that was a good place to say amen. amen. All right, so uh, this week we're going to be looking at part two of I Don't Want Your Money. I Don't Want Your Money. And again, last week we started a new series uh, called I Don't Want Your Money. Uh, we talked about where money comes from. And so this week we're going to be talking about spending. Where does our money go? So again, in the first lesson, we focused in on three things. Everything belongs to God. God gives us the ability to earn money. And the pursuit of money must be kept in perspective. Pursuit of money must be kept in perspective. And so in this sermon, we're going to look at trying to bring, out, bring our finances under control. Not like any of us ever have to do that through uh, contentment and containment. Contentment and containment. You know, there was a story that's being told, I've heard it, uh, about two friends who met on the street one day and they were talking and one man looked over at the other and he looked so sad and he was almost on the verge of tears. And so his friend asked him, he said, uh, how come you look like your whole world has caved in? And the guy looked back up to him, sad, and he says, well, let me tell you, Three weeks ago, my uncle died, and he left me $50,000. Well, that, you know, I got the, friend, the other friend's attention, because he said, man, that's not bad. He said, yeah, but hold on, I'm just getting started. Two weeks ago, a cousin I never knew kicked the bucket and left me $95,000 tax-free to boot. <laughs> now this got his other friend's attention pretty good. He said, well... That's great. Man, I'd like that. He says, yeah, last week my grandfather passed away and I inherited almost a million dollars. By now the other friend is going, you're sad? He says, so why are you so sad and so glum? He says, well, this week nobody's passed away. Oh, the challenge of money and possessions. How much is enough? You know, isn't that the mantra of our generation? Just a little bit more? Just a little bit more? And not, not my generation, but I think it could be construed for all generations. How much is enough? Never enough. Always just a little bit more. You know, Jesus warned us about that mantra. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. He warned us about that in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 saying, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, all of his possessions. But you know, in today's society, that's not what the advertisers tell us, is it? That's not what advertisers tell us. 
You know, every day we're bombarded with what? We're bombarded with advertising on billboards and magazines, radio, television, and now on the internet every time you want to watch your favorite video on YouTube. You know, I, I, I used to just, okay, one, two, skip. Now, you know, you got you to gotta watch 25. They get you hung into that video, and then they say, oh, advertisement starting right in the middle of it. You know what I do? Psst, I'm gone. But the point is, is they're looking at more unique ways to draw you into owning you through advertising. And all these ads are designed to do what? Make us, the consumer, go buy something. Not something we may really need, but something we really want. <laughs> like a new car, new clothes, new electronic devices. And the advertisers insinuate that buying these things, we will all have a better life and will certainly be happy, right? And we all know how that goes, don't we? The newness wears off, <laughs> the car gets rusty, how many of you, you know, after about a year of driving that car, are you ready for a new one? You don't need it, but man, yeah, I'm ready for a new car. The batteries start to die, you know, eventually parts wear out. And, and you know, cars and vehicles and electronics and all that are, are newer, faster, nicer, colorfuller. <laughs> Is that a real word? <laughs> I'm looking back at, you know, my educator, colorfuller. <laughs> it's, it's Medea. She showed up. <laughs> so, uh, but then what happens is the cycle starts all over again, doesn't it? Because what was once nice is now used, and so it's not meeting our, not, it's not meeting our need, but it's not fulfilling our desire anymore. So uh, what begins to happen is the cycle starts all over again, and one of the more dangerous developments you know, really in the last decade or two has been the move by advertisers to target our kids. You know, when I was growing up, you had TV on Saturday, and that's when we got to look at all the new toys. Now they come at you, you know, they, come, they show up at all hours. Look, I want. Yeah. Is it a need or a want? And so Nathan, um, Nathan uh, Dungan who's the president of Share, Save, and Spend, an organization that helps youths and adults achieve financial sanity, shares the following startling statistics from 2000, and these are statistics that were right around 2007. The average child, or the average child experiences as many as 3,000 advertising impressions each day. Children today spend five times more in money than their parents did at the same age, and that's adjusted for inflation. Young adults aged 25 to 34 are one of the fastest growing age groups filing for bankruptcy. He says that the list of what people believe are their needs versus their wants have grown dramatically in years. And really, if we look at it, the truth of the matter is that most Americans are addicted to spending. And I mean, if I was honest with myself, I like to spend. I mean, I do. It's just I like the bigger ticket items. Don't you? I mean, I like to look nice. I like to, anyways, we'll just leave it at I like to spend. <clears throat> and so, could that be an addiction? Possibly. And so, but however, where we're getting into trouble most of the time is that we're spending more than what we earn. We're spending more than what we earn. You say, well, how can, a, how can a person spend more than what they earn? Simply, it's called CC, credit cards. Credit cards. And you know, if you have decent credit, they, they like to give you credit cards so you can get what you want right now. You don't have to wait for it. You just have to pay for it later. And sometimes paying for it is you know, how many of you ever thought, man, I'll just buy this, I'll put it on my credit card, and, you know, we'll just pay it off, and blah, blah, blah. Well, the credit card statement came, and, you know, the money to pay it off wasn't quite there yet. And so now you're carrying a balance. So um, one, of the, one of the interesting statistics I found in the study is that the total consumer debt is at $1.7 trillion. The personal credit card debt carried by the average American is almost $9,000 per household. 9,000. You say, well, that's not me. 
That's either you're blessed or you're in trouble. So $9,000 per household, and there were approximately 1.3 million credit card holders declaring bankruptcy in 2007, and that average has increased. And bankruptcies have exceeded 1 million per year every year for at least 11 of the last seven years. And it shows you how easily it is for us to get into a buying spending habit on tomorrow without being prepared to. We always think the future is better and brighter than sometimes it's out there. And we've all made errors in our financial realms. And we're going to be looking at uh, how we can kind of bring some of our spending in to um, a cost analysis so that you know, we don't get into trouble. Because none of us know what tomorrow holds. And we always think, well, you know, buy today, we'll pay for it tomorrow. But sometimes tomorrow isn't as good as today. And so, uh, as I've described the challenges that we're up against then, let's discuss some of the solutions to um, financial, if we want to call it prosperity. And um, so, we're in the second lesson uh, of this series called I Don't Want Your Money. And last week we started the series by discussing where our money comes from and the perspective we should have about our money. And if you missed the lesson last week, then I'd, I'd encourage you to go to our website or it's even on Facebook and listen to it online and just kind of get caught up. So but today we're going to learn uh, just a little more common sense uh, and understanding that, you know, how God owns everything and everything is his. And that's the right foundation as we understand it all begins with God. And once we understand that, then we can proceed with the next principle, and that is that God gives us the ability to earn a living and provide for ourselves. We're not to be freeloaders. You know, that's, I think that's the fallacy of, you know, I'll just sit around and put on my angelic wings and eat bonbons, and God's going to just do everything for me. No, He gives us the power to get or earn or make wealth, a living. And so... Um, he gives us the ability to earn a living and provide for ourselves, but then God also expects us to employ our gifts and talents in order to provide for ourselves and support the work of his kingdom. And as we earn money and invest it in spiritual ways, we must keep it in proper perspective as well. Money must not be allowed to take over and become our God. Become our God. And it's easy, as we found out last week, that it could be easily promoted to a place or a level in our life where we actually worship it. But it must not become our God. And today I want to give us two words to focus on that I believe will help us reach the goal of having common sense in regards to our spending habits. Two words. And the two words are contentment and containment. Contentment and containment. Now when we look at the word contentment, Let's start out by looking at a, a few verses of scriptures. And in Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, verse 6 through 8, the Bible tells us, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. So, in one aspect, you know, this scripture just kind of gets down to the nitty gritty, doesn't it? We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out from it. Doesn't that say something about the value of things? What we came into the world with was nothing is what we're going to leave the world with with nothing, you know, as far as material possessions. But doesn't that say something about how we should travel through life? Traveling through life, we should be content. In whatever phase and wherever we're at, whatever's going on, we should be content. Paul says that if we have the simple things we need, then we'll be content with that. I'm content when I have a house. I'm content when I have food in my belly. How many of you get uncontent when there's no food in your belly? <laughs> my, what do they call it? Grang, gr angry. No, angry is, but what's the word now where you? Angry. Hangry. Hangry. That's my wife tell me, you're hangry. You, say, you bet I am. Feed me, woman. <laughs> and I go from hangry to love. I'm the love child when I get, so, you know, I'm content is a better word. And so when we have our needs met, then we're content. When our bills are paid, we have clothing, we have transportation, we have maybe provision. There's contentment. Where we get in trouble is, is that we begin looking for the bigger, the badder, the better, the next 
and we get uncontent. So, the question then remains is when we have all of our needs met, will we really be content with that? Can we really be content with that? And that's a personal question. John Taylor wrote this. He said, our enemy is not possessions, but excess. Our battle cry is not nothing, but enough. And that is part of the challenge, isn't it? It would be one thing if God said we can't have anything and that we should go through life with nothing. And although, although that would be very difficult, at least would be clear and simple, right? You don't get nothing. But we're not forbidden by God to have things. The Bible is clear on that. God says that we can have them, but we must not love them. Put our trust in them or be discontent with them. And that's where all this gets very tricky, right? I mean, we can possess things, but they cannot or must not possess us. We can buy things, but when we buy things, we cannot be discontent. And it's easy after a simple period of time to be discontent and begin what I call wandering eye and begin looking at the next thing. I mean, how many of you, I mean, I've got the new, not the new, it's the old A iPhone 8 <laughs> but it's newer than the iPhone 6 that I had but you know I hear they're coming out with a new iPhone you know and bigger better the iPhone 10 man's face res recognition I'm thinking wow you know what's next well every time an iPhone is released it comes out with this bigger badder, better camera and you know for us who like selfies high definition that's en enticing so you have to be careful even in just, you know, we're using the iPhone as an example, how quickly something changes and the new model is out, not to be discontent with what you have. And so we can possess things, but they can't possess us. And we can buy things, yet we must not become discontent. And the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says, says this. He said, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said never will I leave you never will I forsake you stay so we say with confidence the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid what man can do for me so a key to our contentment would be our relationship with God God is our greatest hope and our greatest possession and I'm telling you, when you're right with God, the world's right. And he has promised to be with us. He's promised to help us. Paul took great comfort of the fact that, of that fact when he was in the Roman prison. In his letter to the Philippians, in chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Paul writes this. He says, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in and in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So this is the first and most important step in controlling our spending is contentment. If you're content with what you have, you won't be running out to buy something newer, better, better. There are times, folks, when it's, it's time to, to invest. And there's nothing wrong with that. But just to invest, to invest, to invest because you want it and you're discontent with what you have, but with what you have is working well, they may, and I'm not saying it's the wrong reason, I'm just saying it might be the wrong reason for you. So one of the, one of the first and most important steps in controlling our spending then would be contentment. And you know, if we'll invest ourselves fully in godliness and couple that with contentment, then money and possession will be less of a danger for us. There's nothing wrong with having money, nothing wrong with having possessions. But when money and possessions have you, that's where we get into trouble. But if we don't focus on godliness and contentment, then we're an easy prey for the devil, aren't we? We're an easy prey for the devil. So, if we become discontent, then I believe we'll... we'll we will experience the tragic result that Paul describes in 1 in Timothy chapter 6, 9 and 10, when he says, 
People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds. Now, it doesn't say that money. He says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. See, God doesn't want us to end up in the state of grief and destruction. He has a great plan for us. He wants to bless us. He wants to uh, enlarge our tents, if you will. Godliness and contentment are the cure uh, and the safeguard. I'll say that again. Godliness and contentment are the cure and safeguard for overspending. It really is. And I use the word contentment. How many of you have ever bought stuff out of contentment? It's usually, di now we're not talking about having to buy something out of need, but so most of the time that I buy, you know, some of my stupid things, it's discontentment. And then you, you think, now why did I buy that? <laughs> because I wanted it. Yeah, but did I need it? Nope. I shouldn't have spent the money. That's right. Why did I buy that? <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever had those type of discussions? You walk out of the store and you're just sick with yourself because you know you, know you didn't need it and you bought it because you want it and you really didn't have the money to spend on it. But now it's going to look good hanging on the wall. I did that with one of them bass fish things one time. No. <laughs> the singing bass. Wanted it. <laughs> what do they call it? <laughs> Never mind. And so the other word I want to uh, encourage us to concentrate on in this particular study is containment. Containment. And people who exercise good common sense with money are those who manage their money by design and not by default. Manage their money by design and not by default. In other words, they have a plan for their spending. They have a plan for their spending. They know what's coming in and what's going out, and they make conscious choices along the way. Conscious choices. Have you ever heard people say this? I, I just don't know where my money goes. <laughs> I, know, I know it comes in on the 31st and the 1st, but man, it just disappears. I don't know where my money goes. Well, many people don't know where their money goes because they don't look. Simple. And they don't look because I tell you, there's times in my life I just don't want to know. I don't want to know because I'm having fun having it disappear. <laughs> Have you ever had fun watching me? <laughs> I know I'm not spending right, but I don't want to know where it's going because I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. I'm going to pay the consequences in about a week when the bills come due, but I'm having fun right now. Right now. And so... Uh, bring in, then bring in containment to our spending requires that we assess how much we have coming in, track what we spent, how we spend it, and estimate what we'll have in the future. Containment. And bring in containment to our money management requires that we live by, live by and here comes that B word, budget. How many of you, when you hear that word budget, you go, I do, I cringe. Because I know no one, no one in their right mind wants to live on a budget. We want to spend, 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 don't we? But the reality that you're looking at me like, Pastor, I, I, I definitely want to. I love the budget. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. I don't like being told no when I want it. Yes. I want it now. I want it now. <laughs> That's, that was my mantra. <laughs> And so, sorry, I regressed for a moment. So, C.E. Hoover described the function of a budget as telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Instead of wondering where it went. And if any of us are not operating by budget, then we're doomed to have our lives and expenses run out of control. And as long as we avoid a budget, then we're vulnerable to impulse spending and overspending. And those are my two favorite types of spending, impulse and over. <laughs> it is, man. I'm just, I enjoy spending money, especially if it's somebody else's. And so, as I just stated, for many people, the word budget has a negative connotation, doesn't it? Instead of thinking of a budget as, a, as financial handcuffs, I want you to encourage you today to think of, uh, of it as a means to achieve financial peace and stewardship. And whether we make thousands of dollars a year or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, a budget is an important step towards bringing money under control rather than being controlled by it. 
I, vivid, I, I vividly remember when Kim and I uh, sat down and figured up our first budget as a married couple. It was one of the first times that we could really do it, full-time salary. And, uh, you know, and man, I had these grandiose ideas of how much we had and how much we were bringing in and how much I was going to be able to spend, what I wanted to buy. And, you know, um, when, we got down, when we got down to it, you know, I was crushed initially when I looked at the numbers. We wrote down what we planned to give, what we planned to spend on housing, food, car insurance, gas, etc. And there was no money left over for some of the things I wanted. <laughs> yeah, budgetary spending. That brings the impulsiveness out of it. And so, but I did learn an important lesson that day about the importance of a budget. And all along the way in our 20 year, 29 years of marriage, we have tried to honor God with our money, first and foremost. God has graciously provided for us, and we've never lacked what we truly needed. Now, there are times where it seems like God's late, but He's not late. Amen? He, sometimes He's growing us. Sometimes He's causing us to grow and expand our own faith. And, um, but God says that He'll take care of us, and He does. And because Kim and I are on the same page financially and have been careful about not busting the budget, you know, over the years, there's been little, just not been a, a lot of conflict in our marriage about money. That's one thing that we've been in agreement on. You, uh, I used to stay th say this, you know, what's mine is hers, and what's hers is hers. And, but in our financial realm, it's always been 50-50. We don't have separate accounts. We don't have... You know, we may have dual accounts where each of us have our own checking accounts, but what's in that account, I'm a, I can go get if I want it. There isn't one checking account that I'll put, she, she writes me a little allowance check or something. Everything is 50-50 in our relationship when it comes to money. We know where we stand, we know what we have, and we, we've set limits on what can be spent. In, in, in dollar amounts. We have a discussion place. You know what I mean by that? Let's say she's, now hypothetical, she's going to spend 50, it used to be $50 when we were really young. She says, I, I need, and that was back when $50 was like $1,000. But she says, you know, I, I, I'm, I want to buy this, it's going to cost $50. Well, that was the, at the, if it was $49.95, she didn't have to come ask. But at $50, that was our discussion point. Now, wherever you create a discussion point, that's where it should be. If it's 200, 300, 500, 1,000, wherever you're at, there, there ought to be a place where, you know, unexpected surprises don't show up in the mailbox. Hmm, how much was that? Don't ask. I just did. You don't want to know. Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, and with online banking, you can't hide nothing anymore. And that's why it's important that you all be part of the same account because it brings, it, it helps bring unity, conformity, and trust. When you hide things from each other in the relationship, especially in finances, it's going to create problems somewhere down the road. And because Kim and I have been on the same page, it's been an easy ride. But I also want you to understand that I don't, I, I don't use us to imply that we've been perfect in our financial management. We have not. I can guarantee you that. But I say it to encourage you that the financial management can be done, and when it's done, it's a blessing. You know, it worked when we had very little money at the beginning of our marriage and it's still working today, 29 years later. Uh, you know, the only difference is it's just a little bit bigger. You know, you, you, I'm managing a small corporation now. So, but you know, Jesus emphasized faithful stewardship in his teachings when he taught in Luke chapter 16 verses 10 through 13 he said who whosoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much so if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth who will trust you with true riches and if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property who will give you property of your own no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will de be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And, you know, we laugh about it, we kid about it, but budgeting, uh, 
is one, of, is one way of exercising faithful stewardship. It's not the only way, it is one way. And if you're not presently working with a budget, how do you get started? I know this is really practical stuff, but sometimes when we talk about things in the church, we just need to be practical. The first way you, you start on a budget is you ter determine how much money you have to work with each month. Just simple as that. How much money? We're not talking about gross. We're talking about your net. How much money do you actually have coming into the house? And it's good when you write all that down because I think sometimes we're amazed at either how much we have or how little we have. And the second, the second part of a budget is you add up all your, per, your present expenses each month, including the giving, the household, the housing, food, transportation, food, everything, subscriptions, clothing, insurance, anything and everything that money's going out of the house for, you add it up. And then, you know, when you find out that your, your expenses are greater than your income, you have a problem, right? I know you're probably saying, man, this guy is the master of obvious, right? I've got a problem. My spending is more than my income. What do we do then when that occurs? You know, if you come in under budget, man, then you've got money going into savings. But if you're over budget, you don't have enough money. And so what do you do? What can be done when expenses exceed income? Well, the easiest thing is we can find ways to increase our income. And many people go out and get another job or decrease the expenses. I'm just going to give you some um, very simplistic, easy ways to decrease. I'm not saying you have to do this. I'm not saying go out and do it, but I'm just giving you ideas how to decrease. Maybe you're spending, you know, tightening your belt would be another word on our expenses. Maybe, maybe very difficult, but it's necessary when expenses are greater than income. And You'd be surprised how quickly we can get our finances under control by making a few small changes over a period of time. It's amazing to me when we begin to cut out some of the things that we think we need. Now, in today's society, you know, there are just some things you need. Internet is one of them. But do you need, you know, the 100, 200, 500 channels on your cable TV? Or can you get by with the local stations? And so sometimes by just cutting out the cable, you know, you could save 100. A month comes out to 1200 a year getting rid of maybe a high car payment for a season of time you know you got that beautiful hot rod that you really love but maybe that's just costing you too much money so maybe you get rid of that and buy an inexpensive used car until you get your expenses in order now these are things you don't have to do forever but maybe to cost cut effectively to help you get under budget how about how many times do we go to Starbucks a day you know a, a daily cup of coffee can add up, just a daily cup of coffee can add up to over $500 a year. You don't take my coffee away or you're going to, <laughs> you know, there's other things that you can cut. Just look at your budget. What don't, what's necessary, what's a need, what's pleasure. And so if you're honest with yourself and you can answer those questions honestly, I think you'll find um, good areas to make managemental uh, cuts that are not going to hurt you so bad, but yet will help you um, move forward to getting your budget in control. And so, you see, there are many other ways to exercise good stewardship and shave expenses when we have to. And we can look at that in our own households and find that out. But, you know, you have to have a place to live, but do you have to have the finest house of houses? You know, when we're looking at homes today, I don't, even with Kim and I, they said, hey, you're qualified for this. Oh, I am. Yeah, that doesn't mean that you may be qualified for it, but when you get in it, you can afford it. So don't always, when you're looking at homes, don't always buy the top end. When you're looking at apartments, you don't have to have the top of the top. Find what's necessary to meet your needs at the moment. And then as life begins to expand and you begin you, your budget under control and you begin getting money into savings, and, then you can move forward. But, the, but be a good steward of what's got, what God has given you. And, you know, and, and don't fall into the, house, the trap of becoming house poor. Live within your means. The only way you're going to figure out what your means are is by seeing it on paper. I can do it in my head and I'm still going to fail. But if I see it on paper, money coming in, money going out, it will help me to be a better steward of what God gives me. Amen? So materialism is a challenge for all of us, right? Just not 
for the rich. Contentment is the key, whether you're rich or poor. And containment is the key for all of us. Contentment and containment. Being content with what you have and containing your spending. Regardless of the income, anyone can outspend their income. How many remember back in uh, the backlash from the NBA from Latrell Sp- I'm going to Spruwell. Spruwell? Spruwell. Yeah, I know. Well, you, when he got, you remember back in 2004, uh, his response to a three year, $21 million offer for, from the Timberwolves? Remember what he said? He said, They're not doing anything for me. I'm at risk. I have a lot of risk here. I have a family to feed. <laughs> $21 million, three year contract. I could do a lot of eating. <laughs> but when asked about his. $1.3 million yacht that was repossessed, what did he say? No comment. He had all this money, but he didn't have control of his spending. So let's keep Jesus' words clearly in our minds when he says in Luke chapter 12, 15, he says, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, he says, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? You know, over the triple doorway of a cathedral in Milan, Italy, are some carvings with a powerful message. On the left door, there is a wreath of roses and the words, All that which pleases, but is for a moment. And then over the right door is a cross with the words, All that which troubles is but for a moment. And then over the center door are the words, that only is important, which is eternal. That only is important, which is eternal. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and the thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As we continue the series on money, let's keep focusing on, God's, on, on God and the things of God. And with God's help, we'll continue to discover ways to arrive at contentment and containment. May God help us be faithful stewards who lay up treasures in heaven so our hearts and our treasure can be in the right place. Amen. And man, I just want to thank each and every one of you and those of you that are watching through uh, Facebook and our multimedia devices uh, for being with us here today. Man, make sure you stay connected with us uh, throughout the week online at hgc.church, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at His Grace Church 3184. And if you like this video and you're watching after the fact on YouTube, man, please give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and man, we'd be much appreciative. So I personally believe that God has something great and unique to say to you this week. Amen. And our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a great week and enjoy the rest of your Memorial Day weekend.